Hello, everybody. <laughs> um, today, we're going to discuss sectional title complexes. Our presenter is Marina Constas. She's, the, as you can see, on the left-hand side. So, by the way, Kanya, can you see my screen? Yes, I can see it now. Thank you. Wonderful. Marina uh, is the author of the book, Demystifying Sectional Title. The last slide of our presentation, you will see all her contact details. Um, do yourself a favor and get yourself one of her books. I've got one here in my, uh, my, um, in my office, and I refer to that to, to her book on a regular basis. Uh, Marina, um, let me just move that. Marina uh, sat on the board of the Community Schemes Ombud Services and is currently a director at BBM Incorporated Attorneys. They're based in um, um, Bedford View. She's a fellow of the Association of Arbitrators, a qualified mediator with the London School of Mediation, and an honorary member of National Association of Managing Agents. Apart from resolving community scheme disputes, she walks marathons, participates in community-based projects, and loves socializing with family and friends. Marina, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate you. And... Um, uh, people, you see there's a chat box. You can ask questions as Marina is uh, giving a presentation. Afterwards, I will read the questions and Marina can answer it. And if you want to uh, ask a question right at the end after we've dealt with all the chat boxes, you're also welcome to do it. You just have to unmute yourself and then you can ask all the questions you want. All right, Marina, thank you for joining us. Over to you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jan. I, I really appreciate that. Um, I know that it's been a little bit of a wobbly start to the morning, but hopefully we can warm up now. Thank you. So Thank you. I love speaking about sectional title. It's a passion of mine. I've been involved in sectional title for the last, I'd say, 25 years. Um, and ultimately, I think that it's really, really a fascinating area of the law, uh, but it's one which is you have to navigate it in a way uh, which it takes a lot of knowledge and skill. So people just coming in and buying a sectional title unit often don't actually realize what they're getting themselves into. And I think that's um, a, a major problem with our sectional title complexes today. I mean, we're looking at 56,000 complexes. I just attended a NAMA National Association of Managing Agents um, conference in Stellenbosch. We're just back from that. And they were talking about 56,000 sectional title schemes across the country. So there's probably more than a million people living in sectional title. Um, and unfortunately, we have yet to get to a point where we're really, really giving the information that, uh, that we require. Uh, so first off, we're talking about sectional title role players. Who, what, what the, what's the terminology in a complex? How do you actually work out who is who? So first of all, the body corporate. The body corporate is made up of every single owner in the scheme. And as soon as that registrar of deeds signs off um, that, that a transfer has taken place, the first transfer has taken place in a body corporate, a body corporate is actually formed. Um, and our body corporates used to be under the 1971 Act. That's, a, that's when sectional titles started in South Africa. So it's, it's really a relatively young body of, of information that we've got. Okay, so we've got the body corporate made up of all owners. The trustees are that merry band of men and women who are actually in charge of the sectional title scheme. And trustees are have got a fiduciary duty of care and skill to look after what is going on in the complex. Um, and yeah, sorry, Danette says I have no sound. Does everybody have sound? Everybody else? I'm sure it's okay. Kay. I hope you. I'm you, sure you it's all good, Marina. Yes, yeah, so I can hear you. Everybody can hear. Yeah. Oh, I have sound. Good, thank you. Right, I'll continue. So the trustees are appointed at every AGM. And they've got the duty of care and skill and diligence in order to manage a sectional title scheme. And there's a huge responsibility on trustees. In fact, in the Community Schemes Ombud Service Act, which came into being in 2016, there's a regulation 14, which actually says 
not only it's they're not only called trustees now, they're called scheme executives. So they've been promoted to say that scheme executives have really, really been um, given a greater onus in terms of what they can and can't do. They've got to make themselves aware of the law. They've got to ask experts around them about the law. If they're not sure, they've got to obtain expert advice. And if they breach their fiduciary duty, trustees can be held personally liable. So, yeah, way no problem to record if you'd like to record this. I'm sure there's no problem with that. Okay, so the, the members of the body corporate, as we said, are all owners. So your tenants don't necessarily have a legal relationship with the body corporate. It's just the owners that, ha that, that are involved with the body corporate. Um, although when we go on to the next point, the community schemes ombud service, I can tell you that the community schemes ombud service actually has is an umbrella body which looks after um, looks after owners. It looks after tenants. If you're a tenant with a problem in the scheme, you can go to the community schemes ombud service in order to um, have your dispute resolved. But the community schemes ombud service was a huge. Uh, which went back many, many years. Over 20 years ago, the South African government started looking into an ombud. And the ombud service, together with the Act, came into being um, during October in 2016, although the Act had been promulgated already in 2011. And what is the, what is the duty and what, what are the responsibilities of the Community Schemes Ombud Service? Well, they're now based in Centurion, and they've got offices all over the country and their duties are really to first of all to keep all the the documentation all your documentation about your scheme your rules your corporate governance um, number two and the most important one from my perspective is that they need to be looking at disputes in sectional title schemes so anytime you have a dispute the community schemes ombud service is the place to go. At the moment, you don't even have to pay a fee to take your dispute to the Community Schemes Ombud Service. It's been waived. And they will call you in for a mediation. And if that mediation doesn't work, then you can go into here um, an adjudication where the legal, legal attorneys who are adjudicators at the Ombud Service, and you can have your dispute adjudicated. Once you receive an award from the Community Schemes Ombud Service, you can also then go on to have that award made an order of the High Court or an order of the Magistrates Court, depending on how much is involved or, or what is involved. So the Community Schemes Ombud has changed the complete landscape of sectional title. It covers sectional title, it covers cluster developments, homeowners associations, retirement villages as well. Um, and share block, which you find a lot in Natal. So the Community Schemes Ombud Service is a body which I think is growing, and you, every single owner, is paying an amount when your complex registers, which it has to be registered with the Community Schemes Ombud Service, you're paying an amount up to 40 rand per month per unit to actually fund the Community Schemes Ombud Service. So that is, uh, that, that's, that's been a great thing. Then we talk about the managing agent. And also, I think my, my talk at the NAMA conference this year spoke about expectations of a managing agent. And I think the managing agent is really misunderstood to a large extent because the managing agent is simply that. It's your manager. It's somebody, it's a company that you appoint. And when you appoint that company, they are simply the agent for the trustees to look after the operations of the body corporate of the complex. Managing agents act in different capacities. Not every managing agent does the same thing. So I think the main point that I want you to take away from you with you today is that the managing agent must have a contract, a written contract, and that will be the key to understanding what the relationship is and what the expectations are between your body corporate and the managing agent. So for example, some managing agents do the levy role, they attend your AGMs, um, they deal with everything. They deal with maintenance on site, with your contractors on site. Then there's some managing agents who don't offer that comprehensive service. They just deal with your um, AGMs and your levy role collecting money, um, et cetera. 
Also, all managing agents have to be registered with the Property Practitioners um, Act. Property Practitioners Act was a new act which became effective in February of this year, 2022. And the agency, together with your um, with your managing uh, your each portfolio manager who's dealing with money um, in any way, should be registered with the PPRA, which is the new regulatory authority. We no longer have an Estate Agency Affairs Board or an Estate Agency Affairs Act. The new act is the a property, profession, uh, property Professionals Act and is the Property Professionals Regulatory Authority, which actually deals with all things on managing agents and estate agents now. The auditor, you've got to have an auditor in sectional title because units need to be your sectional title schemes do require an audit. Um, it's a business that you're dealing with. So at the end of the day, um, the financial statements must be signed off by trustees. And I think it's important that, um, that, that trustees do sign off financial statements. In fact, um, I'm giving you this webinar from a very good client of mine's office because I've got a meeting after this with them. And one of the things that we were talking about early this morning when I arrived with one of the portfolio managers is that she's battling to get trustees to sign financial statements. And without financial statements in a body corporate, you can't, you know, you can't sue for levies, you can't move forward in any way. So that is important. And then, of course, the body corporate insurer or insurance broker, um, great to have a, should, should have a specialized sectional title insurance company because that is your interface with your scheme and with your complex and uh, really, really important to have that relationship to know that you need to get evaluation every three years. And that insurer can actually lead you and guide you through what premiums you need, what are the best options for from an insurance point of view, which you have to have in place. One of my cases I had a while ago, the trustees were held personally liable because the body corporate was not insured. So that is something where your fiduciary duty is definitely breached if your body corporate and your complex, your scheme is not insured. That's just absolutely basic, fundamental fiduciary responsibility. Okay, we can change that slide. Now, something else which is important would be the rules of your scheme. Know the rules, rules of the complex. So let's just go through it. First of all, I mean, we know that you are, as a sectional title scheme, governed by the Sectional Title Schemes Management Act, which is an act of parliament. But together with that act, and what you'll, if you looked up the act, you would find at the back of the act, model rules. So it would be model management rules, model conduct rules, um, and those management and conduct rules really make up the operational daily running. So they, they're kind of there to say how the Act, the Sectional Title Schemes Management Act, needs to be implemented. So it's giving you the tools in order to implement, um, implement that. So first of all, you've got management rules. And in our book, we call the management rules the big brother rules. Those are the important rules, you know, like how to vote, um, things like how trustees are appointed, um, all the all the stuff that is is is, is sort of critical to, to putting a skeleton together of how the scheme is is run. Your management rules can't be amended, by the way, unless you have a unanimous resolution. So anytime you want to change a management rule, I mean, generally you can't, because in my experience, when it comes to unanimous resolutions. It's terribly difficult to get a unanimous resolution. And um, what is a unanimous resolution? You need to have an 80% quorum. And then out of the people who come and who form that quorum, you've got to get everybody to agree. That's a unanimous resolution. Your conduct rules are your baby brother rules. You know, those, um, those rules that cause the most problems, uh, the naughty rules, the rules which are subject to most of our community scheme on but service disputes are conduct rules. So conduct rules are mainly things like, uh, you'll find rules like pets, um, things like parking, not being able to, you shouldn't advertise, the conduct of your owners, the conduct of your tenants. Uh, you'll find things about the pools and supervision of children. Um, you'll find everything to do with 
with with how to to manage the rules in the in the scheme and manage the behavior it's more like behavior in the scheme and those conduct rules have been subject to great scrutiny over the last couple of years particularly by the community scheme ombud service who has seen fit to send out directives to tell you what rules you can and can't have in schemes because we've been pretty naughty in the last couple of years in running a lot of conduct rules which are not valid they're not constitutional they may be discriminatory so in fact when you change your rules we'll talk about that now amending conduct rules um you need to follow certain procedures which i'll talk about now but before i do that if we talk about a conflict what are, what is the management rules and the conduct rules are are conflicted well, then your management rules will always supersede that. What if your management rules and your conduct rules are in conflict with the Act? So let me give you an example. In the Act, it says that the common property is the responsibility of the owners. The common property is the responsibility, the maintenance and upkeep of common property would be the responsibility of the owners. So what happens now when in your management rules, by way of a unanimous resolution, let's just say this is a situation where you get a unanimous resolution, the owners decide that they're going to make roof maintenance the responsibility of each person. So the roof above your head will be your responsibility, each person's. Well, in that case, the sectional title schemes management act will prevail that will supersede any rules that you decide to make by unanimous or special resolution your conduct rules because that's an act of parliament so you can't fob off that duty that's been given in an act and put it in your rules and say well it's in our rules now so that's fine and um, you can definitely get those set of rules overturned so before we talk about amendment of conduct and management rules lately i must say i've been exceptionally busy dealing with rules at the Community Scheme Ombud Service, which we're trying to overturn. So there is a way in terms of Section 39 of the Community Schemes Ombud Service Act, where you can go to the Ombud and take a rule and say, look, we don't like this rule. This rule is discriminatory. It's contrary to public policy. It's illegal. Um, like a rule, for example, that they're able to cut off the electricity for people who owe a rear, uh, levy to in arrears that we are allowed to cut off electricity. I've seen that in many rules. That's completely illegal. So that rule, the ombud would definitely say is 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 um, needs to be removed from from your set of rules. Uh, rules, for example, that prohibit ritual slaughter on common property. The ombud again will say that is unconstitutional. Um, you you have to keep a, you know you can't prohibit a ritual slaughter on common property in a scheme if it's discriminatory in any 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 way um, for example that certain classes of people or certain races are not allowed within a scheme or that the body corporate wants to interview tenants who come into the scheme those kind of things are all exceptionally dodgy gray areas and they they're unconstitutional so you can approach the ombud and ask for those rules to be removed from your set of rules or ask for rules to be substituted. And I must say they're doing a lot of that at the moment, doing a lot of it. Let's go to amendment of conduct and management rules. For me, this is critical. I've seen too many rules which are like model cut and paste rules, which are not relevant to the scheme. So my advice to all schemes is to say, look, you need to tailor make your set of rules for your specific circumstances in your schemes. I mean, they're normal clauses in conduct rules, they're, you know, normal things. But at the end of the day, if your landscaping is different, if the layout of your scheme is different, um, those kind of things, architectural guidelines, possibly that you want to pop into those rules, those kind of things are important. So when you amend your rules, how do you amend your conduct rules? Conduct rules you amend with a special resolution. So in other words, if we are asked to amend rules, which we do on a daily basis, we would first say, right, let's go through the rules with the trustees and put together a new set of rules. So nice, we call it a clean set of rules. The trustees would then have to send those clean set of rules together with a notice of a special general meeting 
to be held within 30 days. Because you're passing a special resolution at that meeting, you'd have 30 days, you have to give 30 days notice. So, but you'd have to attach a copy of the clean rules because nobody is going to be ambushed at that meeting. They must know what, I, what what's in the rules. And at the meeting, you hopefully get your special resolution. Once you've got your special resolution, there are a couple of forms through the community scheme ombud service where you send your rules and why are you sending them to the community scheme ombud service? They used to go to the deeds office, but now you have to go through the community scheme ombud service in order to get a certificate, a compliance certificate. So if anybody's rules have ever been amended now, they need a compliance certificate through the ombud. And when I sat on the board of the community scheme ombud service, I remember they had a room where they had about 10 people going through rules, going through rules saying, no, we don't like this. No, we don't like that. The one rule I must tell you, which came up often was the penalties clause, penalties rule, like fines. So the fines rule came up often and often it was, the, the, the clause was kicked out of, 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 how, of the rules because it didn't give the right to be heard. So your penalties clause has got to be very carefully drafted. Um, otherwise, you, you will not be able to enforce a penalties clause. It must stipulate what the amount of the fine is, and that must be reviewed on an annual basis. Probably, probably at your AGM is a good time to review it. And secondly, uh, you've got to have a right to be heard. You've got to give that person the opportunity to put their case forward to the trustees. Uh, trustees can't just unilaterally impose fines on anybody. When we talk about enforcement of rules, also it's all very well to have the best set of rules in the country um, there, but if you're not going to enforce them, they're, they're a complete waste of time. Who's there to enforce the rules? The managing agent is not there to enforce the rules. The trustees have to enforce the rules and they often use the managing agent to write the letters and to assist them. But just bear in mind that managing agents have got hundreds of buildings um, and, and often can't give the necessary care and attention to enforcing rules. Um, the best way to do it is to have one or two trustees who are in charge of that particular portfolio. And enforcing rules, how do you do it? I mean, you, they're obviously letters of warning. And then you can decide, look, as a body corporate, as trustees, we're not going to deal with an issue between two owners. We're going to direct them to the community scheme ombud service also got to be very careful of going to court lately because where people go to court where a body corporate goes to court or an owner takes another owner to court our high courts at the moment are starting to say look there's a regulatory body for all this so it's almost a way of the courts sort of saying well you know we're too busy for sectional title stuff there's a regulatory body go to the community scheme on but service i don't necessarily agree with that view. And I think in future, we might see a few cases which challenge the couple of high courts that have made those decisions, because I feel that the court has concurrent jurisdiction with the community scheme ombud service. There are certain cases which I think are justifiably taken to high courts, but let's see in the future. So be careful before you go running off to court, maybe get a legal opinion. Um, you don't want a costs order against you. For, for going to court. We have obviously had a number of complaints as well about the community scheme ombud service. Uh, unfortunately, they're government, uh, governmental uh, body and have had their challenges in terms of backlogs and all the usual uh, things that we faced with. But my, my feeling is they're definitely getting better and putting in the right kind of, um, the right kind of tools and mechanisms to make sure that things are quicker. I've had some people who love the community scheme ombud service. They said that we've had hundreds of mediations there and it's worked beautifully. And then there's some people who, who, who've had different challenges. Next uh, slide, please. Okay, we're talking about now meeting and voting, which is, I mean, community, the sectional title schemes management act is prescriptive. It's definitely not a guideline. It tells us exactly how to go about a meeting and, and voting. And I must say that more and more meetings are now virtual, held virtually. And, and this is definitely, definitely something where the trend is a good one. It's a good one. And I'm saying that because I'm talking on behalf of most of my managing agent clients. 
when we say that it's so much better for a managing agent to have a virtual meeting. Um, you know, it's, it's just less traveling. It's they can spend time with their family rather than going up and down. And, and I think it's it benefits everybody. Everybody arrives properly to the meeting. You have less of that kind of uh, aggression. If there was going to be aggression at that meeting, that can be downplayed at, at a virtual meeting. So virtual meetings are on the up and up, no doubt about it. And they are allowed in terms of the management rules in the Sectional Title Schemes Management Act. As long as everybody can be identified, as long as everybody has access to uh, uh, computers and, and laptops and, and the software, we've had a couple of people who say, well, we don't, um, we don't have access because they want to be difficult and they want to stop a meeting happening. Um, and that's where we say, well, you could actually share with other people who do have access. So that's not really a very good excuse. Let's talk about participation quota first. So that's a, a term that you might have heard of if you live in a complex. But for those of you who are unsure, it's called PQ. So PQ, what you do to work out participation quota, uh, which is more or less your stake, your ownership stake in the entire scheme, I liken it usually to a NACHI. So if you have a full NACHI, you take the section of a NACHI, and that would be the unit, the square metrage of your unit, of your own unit is one segment of the NACHI, and you divide the square metrage between all the sections, all the different segments of the NACHI, which might be different. The one might be bigger, the one might have three bedrooms, the one might have two bedrooms, and then you get um, a figure, which is close to a decimal, a, a decimal place, which tells you what percentage stake you have in the sectional title scheme. So what does that mean? That means that your PQ is based on the size of your unit. It doesn't include common property at all. Common property is like the peel, the full peel around the NACHI. And, and that participation quota will talk to what voting rights you have, because the larger your unit, the more voting power you have, the higher your percentage when you work it out on PQ, and also your liability in terms of how much levy you pay. So that's what, about, that, what, what PQ actually means, um, and it's taken in, into account in most voting, um, in, in most of the voting that we've got at the moment. So anytime you have to vote, um, you vote on PQ. For ordinary resolutions, you also vote on PQ. All right, so that's participation quota. When we're talking about quorum, quorum is a number that's got to be reached in order for you to be able to proceed with your meeting. And it's the number of people present at a meeting in order for the meeting to go ahead. And your quorums nowadays are based on PQ. So it's, uh, it's, not, only ba it's not based on how many people, how many uh, figures are there. It's based on participation quota. If you're having a quorum for an, uh, an, uh, an AGM or a normal, yeah, an AGM or a special general meeting, your quorums, if you have more than four units in the scheme, your quorum would be one third. Um, uh, one third. So you need your 33.3% your of your participation quota there, present and ready to vote. If it's a trustees meeting, it's 50%, 50% of, of the people voting. All right, so your PQ, your quorum, and your voting is, is important. When you vote, again, it's based on participation quota. Um, and nowadays, you've got really clever apps that are utilized at AGMs and special general meetings where this can be all, re all recorded on an app. So you, there's no more recording and writing and raising your hands and, and doing all that type of thing. So that's where voting um, is critical. Obviously, your notices and that are also critical. If we're talking about our annual general meeting, your annual general meeting has to be held within four months of your financial year end. And so many people have said, yeah, but what, what happens if it doesn't? I mean, my body corporate hasn't had an annual general meeting for ages. Well, there's no real punitive measure that anybody can take. Um, if a body corporate doesn't have an annual general meeting, safe to take them to the CSOS, the Community Scheme Ombud, to say, 
you know, there's a directive that they've got to give an award to say that to compel the body corporate to have an annual general meeting. But annual general meetings follow the normal uh, process that, that other meetings follow, apart from the fact that you've got to give 30 days notice if at that annual general meeting you're going to take a special or unanimous resolution. You definitely need 30 days notice. If you don't um, need special or unanimous resolution, uh, which is quite unusual, then it's 14 days notice. You can actually, interestingly, there was an, a, an amendment which came in quite recently, which said that everybody, if you don't feel like having an annual general meeting, and I think this was quite COVID related, it was almost intuitive that COVID was coming. If you don't want to have an annual general meeting, you can waive the, 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 the owners can waive the right to have an annual general meeting, as long as everybody votes um, on each resolution that should have been taken at the annual general meeting. If you look at the Act, there's a whole lot of separate things, items that are dealt with, and they set in stone, they specific, you know, like who the auditor is, um, what the income is, you know, all these kind of things on, on, on at the AGM. And there you can waive as long as you, you know, give, give a, a, a resolution on those, on, on whatever you've tabled. Special general meetings often held in many, many complexes across the country. If there's something to be spoken about, you put it to a special general meeting. And my advice to many trustees is to say, you know, if you're unsure about something or you're unsure about a decision that you're taking, bring people in on it. Don't ambush people because that's a surefire fire way to get people uh, against you on a lot of decisions, even if your decision is ultimately the right one. So your special general meetings uh, bring people in on. Something I want to just chat about, you know, owner's power. An owner's power is incredibly important. And owners have said, yeah, but you know, we would like to call a meeting. What, what happens if we want to call a meeting, not the trustees? Well, there's a fantastic provision in Management Rule 17.4, which talks directly to that. And it says, if you as an owner can get 25% of the support of other owners in number and in value, in other words, in number and by way of PQ, and you put it in a letter to the trustees, you say to the trustees, we're calling a meeting, that, but then people must sign, that 25% of those people must sign. We're calling an, a meeting. Uh, we'd like you as trustees to call a meeting within 14 days in terms of this section, um, this management rule 17.4. And we need you to call it in 14 days. If you don't call the meeting, we'll call the meeting. And you must say what the meeting is about. So even if that meeting is a vote of no confidence in the trustees, you can force the trustees to call that meeting. If they don't, you call the meeting. That 25% of owners calls the meeting. And uh, ultimately, as long as people know what the meeting is about, they can actually vote the trustees out at that meeting by way of an ordinary resolution. So that's 51% of owners can vote the trustees out. It's a question I get a lot as well. How do you get rid of the trustees? They've been here for too long. They're making all the wrong decisions. It's actually much easier than you think. Okay, so we've spoken about an annual general meeting and a special general meeting. Trustees meetings. So trustees meetings are generally dealt with on quite an informal basis. Uh, it's important that um, a no notice is given, usually seven days notice is given of trustees meetings. And uh, trustees can be, I would say, you know, they can meet online as well. They can meet virtually as long as you can identify them. There should be a quorum is 50% of trustees need to be available at that meeting. But if there's not a quorum, there's a lovely little clause in the management rules, which says the trustees can actually make the decisions, even if there's not a quorum, but then those decisions have to be retrospectively ratified. In other words, agreed upon after the fact by the other trustees. I think there's a recognition that, you know, during the argy bargy of life, maybe trustees can't all get together at the same time or whatever it is. I mean, it's a, it's a big job. Um, and at the end of the day, people have their own pressures in life. So that is something that's recognized. Who may attend the trustees meetings? Oh, that's also a good question. 
asks, owners will phone and say, I need to get into one of those trustees meetings. They need to understand what problems we're facing and we need to speak to them face to face. Well, that is definitely a possibility. So owners are entitled to attend trustees meetings. They're entitled to get notification of when trustees are having meetings. And then they can say, look, we want to attend a, a trustees meeting for the following reasons. The trustees can give permission or should give permission, um, but they're obviously allowed to speak, but not vote on anything. They can speak. However, there are situations where trustees may feel that they're confidential issues which are being dealt with at that meeting or where the privacy um, of a member is, is being significantly jeopardized or there's a dispute that's going on with somebody that they don't really want anybody else to know about at that stage and it's quite sensitive information and that's when trustees can actually say, no, you're not allowed to come uh, to this meeting. People also say, as people asked at the beginning of this seminar here, what about recording? Can we record meetings? Well, there again, you are able to, um, you should be able to record meetings. In my view, there's no reason why meetings should not be, um, should not be recorded. Um, and I think that's um, a right that you do have. Um, so yeah, there's obviously something to hide if people don't want the meetings recorded for me. So duties of um, duties of the trustees. So we've said that the trustees do have a fiduciary duty. And more and more, I'm not sure what it is. Maybe it's because people want to make money on the side or they need a side hustle. We found that sometimes there's too much confusion within a scheme because a trustee might actually be involved in another business and um, actually be um, involved in in sort of getting people to come in and doing paid jobs or coming in and doing uh, work for the corporate, have some sort of interest in the body corporate, which is not strictly speaking allowed because if you're making money, um, if you're making money out of, a, out, of, out of something, then you've got a conflict of interest. So that conflict of interest needs to be dealt with. If you come to the party and say, look, I do have an interest in this, but I think they're the best guys to go with and um, everybody's happy because you're very competent and they trust you. You must have every owner's consent in writing to be able to go forward. Also, as a trustee, you aren't allowed to make any decisions. You must recuse yourself from any decisions which involve anything that's going to be in your interest or be conflicting you know, with you. That's very, very clear. Um, what about paying trustees? Because trustees have got so many duties and, and I mean, it's, it's, it's really quite a big job. My personal view is that trustees shouldn't actually be paid. Um, I think it's a civic responsibility and it's something where you are protecting your asset. But if the, they do, if the body corporate agrees um, that you can be paid, you would need, um, you would require a unanimous resolution to decide if an owner as a trustee can be paid and a special resolution to decide if um, an outside trustee, somebody who's not an owner, can be paid. So note that I could be a trustee of your building or Jan could be a trustee of your building. We don't need to be owners in your building. And before the new sectional title schemes management act came out, the law said that you had to have a majority of owners as trustees. Now that's gone. You don't have to have a majority of owners as trustees. So, you know, at the, at the end of the day, you could have all the trustees being non-managing and uh, non-owners in a building. And in fact, uh, it's a trend around the world where you're having that. You're having more business-oriented people being um, owners and actually paying them. The other trend is also executive managing agent. If the trustee simply can't get it together to manage or they just have some conflict um, or there's been some order against them, you can also have an executive managing agent, which is a normal managing agent, just with increased power. Uh, they actually take on liability and work with the trustees, but can take the decisions the trustees would usually take. So those are usually buildings where there's trouble. Um, they're not administrators, but they are executive managing agents. I can tell you as well that the Community Scheme Ombud Service has a panel now of 25 executive managing agents from which to choose. 
If a body corporate wants to appoint a, an executive managing agent, a special resolution would be required to do so. 75%, what's a special resolution? 75% um, of owners in number and value. When we say value, it means PQ, what that percentage, how, how, the vote that you hold. Um, must vote and you must get a resolution passed uh, to obtain a special resolution. So that we've spoken about an ordinary resolution, we've spoken about a unanimous resolution, um, and we've now spoken about special resolutions. So those are the types of resolutions, and they set out in the Sexual Titles Act what has to be special and what not, what doesn't have to be. Thank you. Next slide. All right, we talk about the financial management of a body corporate, and I think in many situations, body, bodies corporate and homeowners associations and the value that they've put on the table has been really underestimated in the past. Uh, you've got to treat your building like a business. If you don't, you're really going to face problems in the future in terms of um, not bringing in enough money, not pursuing a real levies properly, um, and, and getting into debt, getting into a situation where banks are looking at your complex. And although they um, they always deny that they've red line buildings, that is actually going to be something that they, they do look at doing. So who must manage uh, the finances? Well, again, it falls on the trustees. The trustees are responsible for the financial management of the body corporate. You might say, well, actually our managing agent deals with all the money and the finances. And then I would say to you, well, look, I think it's, you've got to be careful with that because it's not ultimately up to the managing agent. It's up to the trustees who basically are the head, the head who, 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 who is responsible for the conduct of the managing agents and seeing what the management agents are, are doing. So you should at all times, whenever documents are signed, you should have two trustees and the managing agent sign whatever documentation needs to be signed, um, or at least one trustee and the managing agent. Um, I think the financial management of a body corporate will rest on the shoulders of the management agent ultimately. Um, and it's a it's a job every month that, that has to be carried out, sending out um, invoices for levies and collecting money. And again, when you have the collection of money, that becomes a vital element um, that falls under the Property Practitioners Act. And you have to have a fidelity fund certificate so that if there's any theft or misappropriation of funds, then you've got recourse as the body corporate. And that's become uh, compulsory now, absolutely compulsory. The Sectional Title Schemes Management Act talks about creating an administrative fund and the trustees in, at the beginning of a body corporate have to open up a bank account with a reputable bank. It can't be an investment account or unit trust account or anything like that. And I think that has to be an administrative fund where your levies come in and out and where you can budget. So you need to set budgets for that. So that's your administrative account or administrative fund. Your reserve funds are something completely separate with the, with the bringing in of the Sectional Title Schemes Management Act again in 2016. There was a really great initiative which talked about reserve funds, which are now compulsory because the legislation was tired of having um, bodies corporate living from hand to mouth and not being able to know what the next step was, if the budget, if the lift broke, if this broke, if that uh, needed maintenance, nobody could afford anything. So now it's compulsory. You've got to open a separate account for your reserve funds. And those reserve funds are calculated um, utilizing a specific um, a template which the community scheme ombud sets out um, but very simply put to you guys is that you need the amount of money which is going to fund your maintenance repair, repair and replacement plan during that coming year during the forthcoming year there's got to be enough money in that reserve fund and again the reserve fund has got to be opened at a bank or a um, a building society uh, where you you have investment free you know it's an investment it's not free from risk it's not an investment kind of platform and um, those reserve funds are for emergencies and to actually fund that maintenance repair and replacement plan what is a maintenance repair and replacement plan it's a 10-year written plan 
that the CSOS, the Community Scheme Ombud Service, is now going to start investigating whether or not your body corporate has this plan in place. So it's a plan which sets out in, in quite in detail, but it doesn't have to cost you 40,000 Rand, um, but it does set out exactly what needs to be uh, done in your building going ahead for, for the next 10 years. So that's where your reserve funds um, are sitting. Your annual audit, yes, a body corporate must be audited annually and your auditors need to be discussed at every AGM and the auditors need to be decided on at every AGM. It's part of that, those points that you need to set out in your, um, at your AGM, which is part of the Act. One of those points is your annual audit. Um, and of course, if your audit is qualified, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's something wrong. But I think it's it's very um, it's vital that everybody starts understanding what is a balance sheet, what is a financial statement of account, um, how do all these things work? Because your owners, if they're disinterested, I think it's it, it creates vulnerability for the body corporate. Your financial year before 2016, your financial year was at the end of March. Um, because of the 2016 Act, as a default position, your financial year is now um, at the end of October. But if you want to change that, you must change that by an ordinary resolution. So an ordinary resolution of the body corporate, which is 51%, can actually amend your financial year. And what we've said, even in our book, we say that you should, you should always try to amend that financial year because it, it really becomes so busy with auditors during the usual financial year in time periods and your body body's corporate often get put onto the back burner um auditors also i think should be specialized in sectional title there are quite a few auditors now i've noticed coming up who only want to do sectional title work and i think that's fantastic just like your insurance should just be sectional title um whoever you surround yourself must be an expert in whatever industry they're dealing with so just on financial management of a body corporate, I want to just go through the levies, how a levy set. So this is a, an incredibly important part of the running and the lifeblood of your, your body co corporate complex. What happens? Just before the AGM, your trustees work together with a managing agent, uh, usually to set a budget for the year ahead. That budget is calculated and they'll say, right, your levy, the levies are going to be X, Y, and Z. At the annual general meeting, the owners are then responsible to um, confirm that levy amount. So the owners would give the go-ahead for that levy. So often when people phone or they say to us, well, you know, at a consultation, we've got nothing to do with this levy. The trustees set the levy. The trustees do not set the levy. The trustees just propose a levy. Owners will then approve it at the AGM and straight after that levy is approved at the AGM, the trustees need to get together and resolve in a written resolution that that is the levy that has been set. If the trustees don't do that, then unfortunately the case can be made that an owner can get away with not paying their levies. And that's a, a serious case that, uh, that uh, took place a couple of years ago uh, called the Peaks Body Corporate versus Prinster, where if you don't have that resolution, there can be a, a problem. So put that resolution in place. Trustees, if any of you are trustees and you're listening, please also make sure that you've got a written resolution on the interest that you're charging on levies. You can charge interest. You can charge um, a National Consumer Act interest rate. I mean, it's up to 24.8%, which you don't, you're not going to charge, but you are entitled to charge interest. You're entitled to charge compound interest. But at the end of the day, if there's no written resolution from the trustees on what interest rate that you're going to charge if people become uh, going to going to default in arrears, then you can only charge a normal standard Mora rate um, of interest. So, so bear that in mind. And having done a lot of collection work with the real levies in the past, the courts will not let you get away with, they want to see the minutes of the meetings, they want to see your financial statements that are signed, they need to see that resolution on the levy and they want to see your interest resolution. So that's just a case of, well, we'll sue them if they're in arrears. Your ducks must be in a row. The trustees' ducks must be in a row as well before we carry on to sue. So, um, yeah, I think that uh, that 
that is really in a nutshell um, the presentation. And I think there are quite a few questions that have been fleshed out of um, out of there. And maybe Jan, if you could um, if you could maybe go through the questions and take me through them or let people ask questions. I'm I'm really I have no problem with that. There's definitely time. Okay. Thanks, Marina. I've certainly learned a lot. Um, interesting, um, all the facts and the developments. Okay, let me go through the questions. Um, let's see quickly. A few people have had problems with sound. But I'm sure we, we got that right. Just before we carry on, please, this is a recording. And um, if you want a copy of the recording, just uh, WhatsApp or email me. Um, you'll see the email address just now, and then um, I can WhatsApp it to you or email it to you. Um, all right, let's go. We are recording this session. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, here's the first question, Marina. Does it cover a business office park? There are owners of each of, uh, of each office. The company manages the common area and charges a fee stroke levy. Should they be registered with the CSOS? Um, yes, definitely. Definitely covers um, the community scheme ombud service covers all those kind of community setups, whether they are residential sectional title or um, or office sectional title. Doesn't matter if they're commercial schemes or or not. And in fact, I must add that the community scheme ombud is not only looking at that kind of situation; they're also looking at uh, communes in the future. Um, they've already looked at cooperatives, which are in, a, in rural areas. So they're looking at student accommodation, which might not even be sectional title as well. So they're trying to pull in as much as possible into the fold. Um, obviously, from a financial point of view, they'll, they'll receive more monies from that as well. We can't, uh, we, that's a bit of a cynical side of me. But at the end of the day, they want to have a control over any type of community scheme. Okay. Um, Gillian is asking, will it be possible, please, to share the slides afterwards? Yes, Gillian, but if you, obviously if you want the recording, it will show on that as well. Uh, the Kanya has answered you. Okay, next question, Vicky. What happens if an owner suffers damages to the unit due to a common property issue? Damage occurred in May 2022, and trustees have never lodged a claim with insurance. What is the way forward now for the owner to claim for the damages to the property from the flooding? Good question. That's a great question. And water ingress is something which is, 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 is a problem. Now we're starting with our rainy season, so we're getting more and more files on the specific issue as well. What happens is as follows. Body corporate has got to deal with common property. So if there is a flooding, if there's, uh, if there's damp coming into a unit, it's usually coming from the outside into the unit. So it's coming into the outer skin of that unit. And the body corporate has the responsibility to fix the problem outside from where it comes, from whence it emanates, so that it stops, so that you don't have any further problems coming in. So they need to waterproof, they need to do gutters, they need to do drainage, whatever they need to do, they have to fix. And they need to do it quite quickly. Because if they don't, that's the time when an owner might have recourse to a damages claim. If they, if they do it, if the body corporate fixes the problem pretty quickly, the inside of that unit is the responsibility of the owner, and the owner needs to fix it. If the body corporate have not put in a claim timelessly, um, you know, you can also uh, take that to the community scheme ombud service, but the unit owner would still be liable for the excess on any insurance claims. Um, it's the only time that an owner has a damages claim against the body corporate is if the body corporate have been negligent, they haven't acted in time, they've allowed the problem to worsen. That is when you could go with your damages claim. Just be cautious with that, though, because, you know, to go to litigation against the body corporate is expensive. So it all depends how much money we're talking. It's only if it's very, very large amounts of money that I think it would be worthwhile to, to go to the, um, the body corporate. The community scheme ombud service would not deal with damages claims. That would a court would deal with. Okay. Um, I see people have asked for copies and Kanya send, said they must send their emails. Kanya, just make sure you get all those emails, please. Um, yes, we've organized that already. Thank you. Thank you, Kanya. 
Oh, looks like okay. Here's a question. Another one from Vicky. If new trustees are being voted in at AGM, is that qualified classified as a special resolution? And therefore the AGM needs the 30-day notice period or is 14-day notice allowed? Uh, Vicky, definitely 14 days. It's not a special resolution. That's an ordinary resolution of the owners there by 51%. Okay. Uh, Ursula, question to Marina. Thank goodness it's to Marina. If there is a special levy of a large amount, when a seller sells to a buyer, should the seller cover the total amount they agreed to in the clearance, or is it in the is it the norm for the buyer to take over that special levy? Your opinion would be appreciated. Yes, yeah, no problem at all. Definitely a question that came up a lot more in the past, but uh, I think it's been clarified. Uh, so there was it was a grey area, but at the end of the day, the law says that the seller would be liable for the special levy. If a special levy was raised before a sale, um, the or even yeah, at any time before registration of that unit, the seller is liable for that special levy always. The only time that you can get away from that is, is if it's contractual. So if the seller says to the buyer, look, the special levy is for painting you're going to benefit from the painting. I'm leaving now. So I think you should pay the special uh, levy and it's part of the deal that they do. You do a tripartite agreement and that tripartite agreement then says that actually the purchaser will be liable. And it must also be part of the sale agreement that the purchaser is liable for that special levy. Otherwise, the default is that the seller is liable. Marina, when you talk about a tripartite agreement, will that be the seller, purchaser and the body corporate? Yes. Wonderful. Let's carry on. Rina, in a complex I know in Whitfield, Boxburg, a lot of the owners built on a few of the, this or these units uh, were sold as close as last year. So the body corporate and management agent signed off the clearance figures. Now with the new body corporate, it's not happening. What can be done now as we know owners will have a challenge, but can all the above uh, with the previous owner be kept, be kept responsible. So Marina, we get it often. We, as you know, we specialize in, in, in conveyancing uh, mm -hmm. where people build on and they never changed anything, um, you know, in terms of the participation quota, etc. So yeah, that's a very relevant question. Please, if you don't mind answering that. Absolutely. Happening every single day because I also think with the social economic crisis we're in, people don't really want to go and buy uh, new places. Uh, they'd rather just build on. And of course, the Sectional Title Schemes, Schemes Management Act um, tells us, speak to us about extensions. And you, you're not entitled to actually extend without, first of all, a plan of the extension a special resolution from the body corporate, your owners, in other words, have to get involved It's not the trustee decision. So once you've got a special resolution, then you can, you have to go on and get apply to the surveyor general. Uh, the a surveyor general um, to a surveyor has to come and survey. And as um, you correctly said, Jan, that has another plan's got to be drawn because that, that um, extra space needs to be drawn into your participation quota because now your section's bigger. So you're going to have to be responsible for a larger levy and you have more voting rights. But the problem is a lot of people just stop short at the special resolution or they don't even get a special resolution and they just build on and your trustees are not robust enough to deal with the situation. So what happens, I mean, again, the trustees should be more proactive. I mean, that's my view. As soon as you see somebody building they need to go there and say, what are you doing? You need to put a stop to it. Um, if the trustees aren't robust enough, then they're stuck with a situation where you've got all these illegal extensions um, in a complex, and those illegal extensions then become an issue. So the trustees can, should decide to maybe get a retrospective special resolution to say, okay, look, we, we know that to, up to here now, We've had all these uh, extensions that have been haven't been good, but we'll give a special resolution. But now the owners of these units need to fix uh, fix up the and go to the surveyor general and do the work that needs to be done to regularise them. There would definitely be a case 
for those current owners to then have a case against the previous owners in terms of the money that is spent, um, you know, for the surveyor. It's an expensive process. I mean, it's not a cheap thing. So it's expensive to get this thing done. So that's why your, your, your initial problem, and it really annoys me, is where trustees aren't taking responsibility for people building in schemes. And again, I always say this, and I wish the deeds officers would get involved to say that we're not transferring units unless we've got the proper details regarding extensions and that this is a, a, this is a compliant building. Um, but I don't suppose that that will be the case anytime soon. They did it once, but I haven't seen it again. Okay. Um, it's not a question, just uh, ZAO177, there's no name, ask if they can have a recording. Um, unfortunately, I don't know who you are. You need to speak to me directly afterwards. Right, Eddie, um, I'm a trustee at a complex. Every year at our AGM, we propose a budget to cover our administrative and maintenance budget. The levy increase get turned down by the majority of the owners, resulting in no funding be available for the reserve fund and barely enough to cover our administration budget. What does we what do we as trustees stand to do? Our building are falling apart due to lack of funding for maintenance. Mm. Such a dangerous, <laughs> such a dangerous position to be in, and 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 one which definitely requires. Uh, sympathy, uh, you're not alone. I think there are many buildings, uh, particularly around Gauteng, that are in exactly the same position. So under those circumstances, what would usually happen is there are two ways to deal with it. The one is that you would um, either have the option to place that building under administration. So that's a set procedure where you're allowed to, at the moment, you're allowed to approach the magistrate's court to place the building under administration so that you get somebody in who is an administrator who would then take over the control of that body corporate, collect levies, set budgets, and almost like it's almost like a business rescue kind of situation where somebody else is now taking over and actually getting these things done. And they have powers that are given to them by court rather than powers given to them by owners. So that's one, it's quite a draconian and, and last resort type of way to deal with it. The second way to deal with it is to appoint an executive managing agent who can also come in, give advice, um, you know, take, take control and actually tell people that they are a wicked to nothing because so many people want low levies. Yeah, a building is this low, low levies haven't been raised for three years. I say to that, that's terrible. Gosh, I wouldn't want to live in your building. Um, levies have got to be a bit higher because those levies are covering your maintenance of common property, um, your you know upkeep of, of things, your insurance. It's covering your employee salaries. Are you have, do you have a good managing agent? You only get what you pay for. You can't expect a good managing agent if you're not going to compensate them. So people do have to realize that, yeah, unfortunately, if you're going to live in a complex You've got rights and responsibilities, and one of those responsibilities is to pay the levy, which is required to run the building. If you don't want to live in sectional title, you've got the absolute right to go and buy a freestanding home, and then you can dictate what happens on that. Okay, great. Thanks, Rob. I see your message there. Uh, Lynette, if an owner puts up their own gutters, in brackets, the units were not built with gutters. The gutters get blocked and the unit gets water damage. Who's responsible? Well, if it's an illegal extension, if it's an illegal something structure that's illegal that you weren't really supposed to put on, you know, attach to common property, you're not allowed to just go ahead and attach things to common property. So that person who attached that to common property would could be looked at, certainly, um, if there was no permission given by the trustees or the body corporate. Okay. Um, right, Sandy, what responsibility does a body corporate have towards the security of the complex or stroke individual units? Well, Sandy, that's huge. I mean, you've got to, you, you as trustees, trustees are definitely in charge of the security of the building and they've got to act in the best interest of the owners. That's what the sectional titles act says. So when it comes to anything to do with security, the trustees are the drivers of these initiatives which deal with security. So let's say, for example, 
um, you want to put in intercom systems and guarding systems. It's not really only a trustee decision because it's going to require money. It's going to require funds. So it's a reasonably necessary improvement to common property. Um, and that is dealt with in the Act. And the Act says that because security is, well, security is by abs absolutely undoubtedly a necessity in a complex. So because it's reasonably necessary, the Act says that you need a special resolution to okay any kind of security initiatives within the scheme, whether it be, you know, placing guards, putting up cameras, dealing with lighting, all that type of thing that you're going to put on your common property structures within your scheme, you need a 75% resolution from all owners. But the trustees, it is their responsibility to drive it, for sure. Okay. I'm running through, uh, it's most of, okay, here's one from Wayne Skuma. Our complex was built 40 plus years ago. The issue we have is that a lot of units now have issues with them due to negligent building materials used back then. Whose problem is it? Uh, the body corporate, managing agent, insurance, owner? Look, the, the issue of damp um, is definitely a body corporate problem because that water is coming in through either the foundations at the bottom or the roofs at the top or the um, the roof, the the, um, the the walls on the side. So the body corporate has to fix that up. They've got to find a solution and they've got to see what a problem, they've got to call waterproofing experts in uh, to see exactly what, what to do there. Insurance companies will often repudiate the insurance policies based on the fact that the trustees haven't put the requisite uh, uh, things in place in order to, um, alleviate the problem or stop the problem completely. But we've got a complex in Santon at the moment, which is facing a huge, huge levy, special levy, because, I mean, they've got to do an inordinate amount of work on the water ingress problem. If they don't, that entire complex is going to start subsiding. So mm -hmm. it is a real problem. I'm aware of that. It's, it's a real problem. Your insurance company, if we think about it, your insurance company will ensure you against sudden events. Something sudden, if a, if a, a geezer bursts or ruptures, um, if something happens suddenly. So if there's a problem with maintenance over a number of years and they've been negligent, insurance is not going to cover uh, damp proofing and, you know, and that kind of thing. They won't cover it. So that's insurance a broker or insurance company can actually come in and, and direct you and guide you. On, on things like that. So, yeah. Thank you. Then, Monica, if an owner has a, a major damage or has the major damages in a downstairs unit caused by a water leak in the upstairs unit bathroom and the managing agent never reported to the owner and refused to give the owner's details to contact him directly, do the owner have a claim and against who? Uh, Marina, this is a question that in conveyancing we get a lot so please help us yeah yes yes with pleasure so so basically your upstairs unit um has a foundation structure there's a foundation slab between the upstairs unit and the downstairs unit and that slab can often be very very thick it's not just a thin little slab and more often than not they're pipes that run within that slab so if there's a leak of any kind, number one, you've got to get a plumber in to find out where that leak is actually situated. Is that leak situated um, if you cut that slab in half horizontally? So just cut in your mind, cut that slab horizontally. The 50% um, and in, in, in half, so 50, that's a median line. The 50% lying under the median line, which would be the top of the under beneath roof, <laughs> that would belong to the guy at the bottom and the upper 50 percentile of that slab would belong to the guy at the top. So if the, the question is, it depends, where is the leak? Is the leak in the 50 percent of the top 
area or the 50% of the bottom area, which we mean it would be the bottom owner's responsibility to fix. And often these plumbers use diet tests, they use gas, they use all sorts of things to find out exactly where that leak is. So let's say, for example, the leak is in the upstairs bath, which is right at the top, it's in the pipe next to the bath, so it's actually the owner at the top's responsibility. The owner at the top does need to be contacted and should be contacted by the managing agent to say that um, you need, uh, you know, the, that owner needs to fix it. It's not the body corporate responsibility. It's that owner's responsibility to, to fix it. If that leak is causing bubbling in the roof of the lower, the downstairs guy, like for example, the ceiling is bubbling or it's moldy or whatever, it's the responsibility of the downstairs guy to fix his own unit. It's the same principle as what I talked about with waterproofing for the body corporate. The owner is responsible for the inside of the unit. It's only when that owner at the top has not done anything to fix the problem in his bath and has just left it and left it and it's got worse and worse and worse, that's when your bottom owner may have a damages claim against the top owner for failing to ensure that the problem has been fixed. Marina, part of Monica's question is, is what, from what I see is, can the managing agent be held liable for this? Mm. No, the thing is, again, the trustees are in charge of this. So the owner shouldn't be dealing with managing agents only. The owner should be going to the trustees and saying, this is the situation. Can you get involved? The managing agent is simply an agent at the end of the day. So I think the, there is a proactive duty on the owners to, to address these issues. Okay, thank you. The next question, if trustees are given an amount of 10,000 Rand maximum to spend on repair stroke maintenance and, and then spend 21,000 on painting previously unpainted prefab walls, can they be held responsible for the cost? How do the owners proceed? Yes, yeah, and I think they probably could be because, you know, the trustees at every AGM in that model uh, template of what has to be spoken about, one of them is restrictions and directions on trustees. Restrictions and directions. So where is these restrictions? Many owners place restrictions on the trustees to say, look, you're not allowed to spend more than X, Y, and Z without reverting back to the body corporate. I mean, we've had trustees who absolutely go completely overboard with the amount of money they spend if they don't have that restriction on them. I mean, one of the complexes took a matter to the appeal court and cost the body corporate about four and a half million rand because the body corporate didn't restrict them in those restrictions and directions. On the other side of the coin, you also can't restrict those trustees too much because they've got to run with accounts and maintenance and repairs. They've got to be flexible. So they can't go running back to the body corporate every time they want to spend a thousand rand. So it also has to be a reasonable amount. And a court could say, well, you know, it's not reasonable to let the trustees spend 10,000 rand every month um, on maintenance. It might need to be higher. But let's just say, for example, that they say it is reasonable and the trustees exceed their powers, then yeah, certainly the trustees could be taken on to refund the balance of what they were not supposed to spend. Okay, great, thank you. Um, can you perhaps elaborate on a little, uh, a little regards to fixing of items, equipment, etc., to common property, uh, joint units, etc., solar installations as an example, and potential liability insurance when taking electrical systems into account? I hope, um, the question yes. is clear, Marina. Yes, um, I think so. So from what I'm understanding, the question relates to these big items on common property, maybe things like air conditioners, uh, generators, uh, solar. Solar is huge, huge at the moment. Every second complex is wanting to put solar in. So that will fall under the Sectional Title Schemes Management Act, which talks about reasonably necessary and not reasonably necessary improvement on common property. Because it's not maintenance or repairs, this doesn't fall under maintenance and repairs. That the trustees have to deal with. These kind of things fall strictly under improvements to common property. 
And when you're going to improve common property in any way, you need to look at whether they're reasonably necessary or not reasonably necessary. So if you want to put a tennis court into your complex, that has been held to be not reasonably necessary. That's a luxury. In the old act, they even spoke about the word luxury. Now they don't. But it's really a luxury. Do you need it or not? If you, if you think it's a luxury, then it has to be a unanimous resolution. Um, if it's reasonably necessary, then all you need from the body corporate is a special resolution. And remember, we said the body corporate is made up of all the owners. So it's the owners who have to give you a special resolution to decide whether or not a generator can go up. There can be solar installation panels on roofs. Um, or air conditioners can be attached to the common property um, area. And very often you will get a special resolution, but with conditions. So the conditions would be that the air conditioners are not noisy, they don't exceed a certain number of decibels, um, that there are only four solar panels per roof or whatever it is. So it's got to be quite a carefully crafted um, agreement or uh, resolution on exactly what uh, what can can happen um, and of course any electrical uh, installations or anything have to go past the trustees the trustees have got to agree on that um, and if things are done illegally then those people putting up those electrical installations um, even for example aerials and things like that they would be held liable if anything happened or if there was a problem with a common property as a result of the installation of illegal structures. Okay, great. Um, the next question is from Carol. Our trustees held the SGM, Special General Meeting, to change managing agents. Quorum was not met according to our current managing agent who is disputing some attendees and proxies and therefore regard the notice as invalid. In the interim, the business has been given uh, to another managing uh, agent, both of which is now charging us a managing fee. Some of the owners are trying to resolve the matter. How can the trustees be held liable for losses incurred? Well, let's first examine how you terminate the services of a managing agent. So the most, um, or let's say, the least dangerous way to, to terminate the, the managing agent is to get a special resolution from the body corporate like they tried to do at the SGM probably. Um, you would give two months notice to the managing agent and that's the easiest way where the managing agent wouldn't come back and have any kind of damages claim against the body corporate. But there is another way to terminate a managing agent and that is the trustees themselves can terminate the managing agent if they say that there's been a breach of contract. So if the managing agent hasn't performed, if there's been any type of breach that would result in, in a breach that you could take to a court. You, so, sorry to interrupt you, Marina. You mentioned earlier on, there must be an agreement between the body corporate, the trustees and the managing agent. And that yes. agreement should basically de deal with a situation like this, isn't it? Contract would, a contract would, but so do the management rules. So if the contract is silent on that, or if it's contrary to the management rules, and the management rules would prevail. But your contract, yes, you must have, you should have a contract in, in writing, although the Act doesn't say any more in writing, but it should be in writing. And it can't be for more than a period of three years in terms of the sectional title schemes management, um, management rules. So at the end of the day, it, it should be guided by the contract, but the, the contract can't be you know, can't give more onerous provisions than what the management rules give. The management rules say get a special resolution and give two months notice, or the trustees can give um, can give notice themselves, but then you might be vulnerable to a claim by the managing agent who says, actually, I didn't breach the contract, and he might take the body corporate to court for payment of the rest of his management time or, or fee for the rest of the outstanding contract. Okay, I hope we've answered that um, question. Next one is who's responsible for the maintenance and upkeep of exclusive use uh, common areas? Should a separate levy be put in place for this? Maintenance of exclusive use areas. So if these exclusive use areas are registered at the deeds office and they, part, they, they, they joined to a person's property, so for example, I own a unit and I have a registered exclusive use area mm -hmm 
garage or carport or garden, um, then I, as the owner, am responsible for that keep and maintenance. If the exclusive use area is rule created through the conduct rules, that's in the rules that I have um, the use of that exclusive use area, then again, in the rules, it would probably stipulate that as the owner, I'm responsible. Um, some people misunderstand exclusive use areas. They think it's their exclusive use area because of the fact that it's a walled garden or it's a balcony that they use exclusively. But actually, you need to check that because that may very well be common property. Okay, great. Uh, Rina has asked a question, but it looks like you've answered it. I hope uh, I read it correctly, Rina. Then Graham is asking, um, it, it, you've dealt with it, but I think the last bit of the question is relevant. If the leak is in the top layer and the owner of the unit above does not want to, to pay to have it fixed, what can the owner of the, the unit below do about it? Is it a simple uh, a, a court case, civil case? Well, I think there you would definitely be entitled to go to the community scheme on but service. Um, on and you could, if it's urgent, you could then ask them if you can go on an urgent basis. And um, they do the urgent matters. Okay, great. I hope, uh, Graham, we answered your question there. People, before we, we close, are there any questions? Anybody that wants to ask Marina a question? Um, just unmute yourself and ask the question. In the meantime, please have a look. Marina's details are here. Um, Marina, maybe you want to give Lola's email address as well. That's uh, Marina's PA, um, if you don't mind, Marina. Okay. Her, yeah, it's a Lola, L-O-L-A, at bbmlaw.co.za. And Jan, I must just uh, tell you that our, our next edition um, is actually will, will come out. We actually sold out. So our next edition will come out towards the end of the year because we've had to include things like the Property Practitioners Act and uh, the Poppy Policies um, Protection of Personal Information Act. Um, and at the end of the day, I think those are quite important things that, that, uh, that needed to be in an update edition. So as soon as they're available, I'll let you know, Jan, and then you can notify everybody. Please we do that. Uh, please do that. Lawrence asking where can we get the book and what's the cost of the book? Well, the cost of the book will probably be about 480 Rand, the next edition. And you can get it um, on our website, which is www.demystifyingsectionaltitle.co.za. But as I said, at the moment, um, everything is sold out and it'll be ready um it'll be certainly ready by next year um and yeah i saw that question about discount we'll let you know <laughs> yeah anyway okay marina thank you so much i'll take it that nobody's going to ask a question um you've got her details i think it's best if you speak to if you want to send an email to lola l-o-l-a at bbmlaw.co.za I know Marina is, uh, is quite busy, but Marina, thank you so much. And everybody, sorry, in the beginning, we had some technical issues. Um, luckily, that came, we all, we fixed that. So Marina, again, thank you. Um, thank you, everybody, for uh, joining us. I hope you learned as much as I did. Marina, thank you. And then um, hopefully we'll chat soon. Thank you so much, Jan, and really well done. Well done for your initiative. Um, you're always educating everybody, and uh, I think you should be greatly appreciated in uh, in the property industry. Thank you so much. Thank you for Thanks, your time. Marina. Cheers, everybody. Have a good day.